On this episode of the show, I sat down with Dr. Ron Stotz. Uh, Ron is a really interesting guy. Uh, he's uh, done a lot of work with focusing on the breath and breath work, um, neurology, conscious leadership. We spoke about all those different topics, uh, as well as his background, what got him interested in doing this work. Uh, we even spoke about martial arts, about plant medicines, about various uh, ways to work with the breath, and um, and really just uh, his, his story and thought. And uh, I, I found it a very interesting conversation. I think he has a lot of knowledge to share and a lot of wisdom. So I think and hope you will all get a lot out of this episode. Um, also, if you're interested in working with plants and uh, you feel like you're gaining something from this podcast, or if you're interested in working more with myself, uh, myself and my colleague, Marav Artsy, uh, we're just finishing up a, a plant medicine dieta, a plant medicine retreat workshop here in the Sacred Valley of Peru. Uh, but we have a couple coming up uh, abroad. Um, we will be in Portugal in May and then Canada in August. Um, and those are really beautiful opportunities if you're interested in working with plants and, and kind of even as we we're speaking about experiencing some of these different states of consciousness, uh, um, uh, the the kind of spirit aspect of working with plants, this ability to really he to, to to really heal us, to really change us, to teach us, um, that's a really beautiful opportunity. We we still have, I believe, a couple spots left for both of those dietas. So if you're interested in that, you can find more information on web uh, on my website, which is nicotianarustica.org, and also my colleague Marav's site, which is tobaccodiets.com. Um, I'll put a link to both of those in the show notes. Um, as always, if you're able to support this podcast, that's a really big help to me. Um, if you're viewing this on YouTube or Rumble, hitting the subscribe button, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, leaving any questions or comments in the comment section, all of those things really help to drive the algorithms to get this show out to a bigger audience. And if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, which tend to be the biggest platforms, leaving a starred rating and a short review is also a really big help. So um, there's also uh, the option if you feel like giving back uh, to this podcast, if you feel like you're gaining something to support via Patreon, um, I'll put a link to, to the, the website in the show notes as well. It's a website you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. There's different tiers you can sign up for. Those tiers give you different things back, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. Um, to all the people who are supporting that way, to all the patrons, as always, thank you very much for your help. I, I really appreciate it. And if you're able to, um, it's really one of the main ways that allows me to keep this podcast going. So if you're able to do that, thank you in advance. So I think that's it for the intro. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Ron. Running out from the maze. Running out from the maze. Running out of the maze. Today. Running out from the maze. Running out from the maze. Running out from the maze. Today, I'm running out from the maze. Running out from the maze. Run out of the maze today. Well, great, Ron. Well, thank you for for coming on and joining. Um, I, we were speaking a little bit before, but I, I think you have a really interesting story, and 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 you're doing really interesting and good work. Um, maybe to begin, I'm, I'm sure you get this question a lot, but maybe you can just speak a bit about your background, about who you are, what the work you do is, and 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 kind of what led you to to get to the point in life that you're in right now. <laughs> That's a long journey. Mm -hmm. Oh so, yeah. Um... You know, I started off as the all-American kid, kind of an outdoor, being raised. You know, I'd leave the house and go into the woods and and hang out all day with my friend, and and come back, uh, you know, by by dinner. And so it was kind of that sort of childhood that they don't have any longer. But uh, you know, it it felt like you know, I noticed I found myself interested in different things. I found myself uh, around twelve exploring different religions. I began to use my breath to explore because I loved to in the summer to swim underwater with the bass at the lake that was near my home and so that 
I began to like, how far can I extend my breath? How long can I hold my breath? And I got up to around three minutes, which back then seemed like a, a lifetime. But, uh, you know, so I started exploring consciousness without even knowing what consciousness was and just being in nature, being in the quiet, being with the breath, being in those uh, moments of silence that I enjoyed so much. And, and then I made this interesting choice to go into the Marine Corps in 1967, which was at the height of the Vietnam War. And uh, I realized, oh, I'm that wasn't quite a fit for me. <laughs> so I did get out on a medical discharge, and uh, but the recovery of that uh, really is what took me onto my path because I just it just threw me off with all, all the stories that I was hearing about people killing other people and being killed. And I lost most of my um, 62 fellows that I went in with. Uh, most didn't come back. And so it, it definitely rocked my world. I ended up going, and there was a small cabin on an island, uh, you know, outhouse and wood stove and water pump sort of rustic place that I really, that's where I learned to, to sit uh, and just, be still and heal and to begin that inner inner journey in, in more of an adult level and uh, became a vegetarian more because I didn't have any money for food. And <laughs> um, but it was coming from that, that cabin and that space of isolation and quiet and introspection that I really began to go, okay, what what am I learning? What do I need? And I began to look for mentors, guides, people who could help me with this path that was un, quite unfamiliar to me in terms of knowing whether there were other people even aware of what I was doing. And so I, I was fortunate enough to, you know, most people don't know their names anymore, but Buckminster Fuller was a significant player in, in my life. And Joseph Campbell uh, he created the hero's journey and that type of thing. And those people were very influential in terms of their wisdom and their insights. And so I began following all of, all of their uh, teachings and got a PhD in psychology and doctor of chiropractic. Um, my meditation, I was, you know, I had spiritual teachers that, uh, you know, I probably, by the time I was in my early forties had about 30,000, 30,000 hours of meditation. So, you know, that was my journey. And throughout that journey, I was looking for what what tools, what ways, what insights do I have that can help other people um, fall in love with themselves and enjoy their life more fully. So that's what I did. And it, what is it about, um, like you, you spoke about it, in your childhood, you began to de develop this connection to to the breath. Do you... Do you think there was something that you were inherently like tapping into? There was something you realized that there was a certain power in breathing, maybe something people were overlooking. Uh, was it just a personal challenge to you? Or did, did you also maybe like, you know, sometimes in, in, in the language of a child, it's, it, we put it in different things, but um, I mean, were, did you find yourself kind of, cause you also use this word consciousness. Like, did you find that something also in your consciousness was changing that you liked, or maybe that even scared you in a way. I mean, what what was it about that that breath that that? I think those to are you? great questions. I remember sitting on my bed with my dad being angry at me. He was a great dad. He, you know, he wouldn't have hit me or anything like that, but he would he would get mad at me because I'd be breathing. <laughs> you know, because I was tense and I was a you know I I displeased dad so. I realized that was the first time I'd be con being conscious that, oh, I'm actually doing something to help me get through this process, you know, to to stay present and not have to, uh, to deal with my feelings, basically. <clears throat> so that's really where the breath came in initially. And, and then, like I say, just recognizing, oh, if I can hold my breath, then I can swim underwater and follow the bass through the to the lily pads and and have that sort of enjoyment with it, but it was it, it was a different state of consciousness. I remember specifically not telling my friends what I was doing because it was 
weird. It was different. And, you know, at 12, you don't want to be weird and different. And uh, so, you know, it, it just became this sort of automatic tool. It's it's become, at this point, my spiritual teacher, my guide. It, it's, it's the thing that I rely on. If I'm in the moment of death, I'm in the moment of the light, whatever it is, my breath is what I know will guide me into and through whatever comes into my life. And it's that absolute depth of that relationship and trust that uh, has really allowed me to to journey into levels of consciousness that I don't think most people are aware of, you know, through meditation, through medita- medicines, through other things, because it, it allows me to always be present and curious. It allows me to always be in a state of consciousness, choose a state of consciousness, if you will, because you can really, with the breath, you can, you know, it's like an elevator. You can use the breath in different ways to take you into the most expanded states of consciousness or in a more contracted, and, and there are times when that's actually useful. But, uh, yeah, so the breath to me is, it's what, you know, when I work, you know, I work with, leaders and teaching them how to breathe and they begin to recognize first the connection that it allows them to have with themselves they they realize they're not breathing because they want to stay up in their head and disconnected from their heart and their gut and so as they breathe into their feelings and get in touch with their emotions and become they fall in love with themselves because they're opening their heart not only initially to themselves but then to others and uh, and that it's it's just that gift that they recognize, oh, in, in leadership, if I'm breathing, I'm not being thrown off by the constant change and increased complexity in the business world. If somebody's going through something and I'm breathing, then my level of emotional intelligence, presence, curiosity is going to allow me to really recognize what my best next option is and be able to take that as consciously as I can. And so, yeah, I just don't see, you know, if I if I want to literally dissolve in the light and go beyond any awareness of my physical form or anything, you can do that. Uh, you know, that's a nice experience. At, at some point, you bring it back down into more practical living and the working and the world experiences. But uh, yeah, it's 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 our greatest gift. It connects us to all of existence. I mean, it, it's interesting because I, I think a lot of people are, I mean, obviously everyone is familiar with the breath um, <laughs> Hopefully. just by the the, 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 de facto sense that it's, it's kind of the first thing we do when we enter this world. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. the, the last thing we do when we exit this world. And I find it interesting because even in a lot of language, uh, like I'm, I'm very fascinated by etymology and even, you know, English, for example, which has some roots in Latin, you, you have these words like respirar, uh, to, to breathe, to be filled with spirit, or we often use the word like someone is inspired. Uh, and, it, you know, uh, it's usually this idea of taking in the breath, being filled with spirit. And mm-hmm. even kind of like I was saying that this idea of the, the first thing we do is to be, to take a breath in, to be filled with spirit. And the last thing we do is to, to exhale, to 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 have our breath, to have spirit leave us. Mm-hmm. And and I think in many probably traditions that, that a lot of people are familiar with, you know, things like yoga or, or tai chi, or even I think in general sports now, people are understanding more the importance or the significance of, of breath. But um, how, and, and I know this is a big question, but but how do you in general start like bringing awareness to, to people about their breath? What 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 are kind of the, the ways that you teach people to, to begin working with their breath? Because again, obviously everyone breathes, but a lot of people are, are very unconscious of their breath and maybe explaining a bit more about how working with or observing or manipulating the breath can, can induce certain things. Yeah. Well, I think the, the easy road is really just to Help, help them notice that they're not breathing when they're dealing with something uncomfortable, emotionally uncomfortable. Uh, how they're not breathing when they're in stress. How they're not breathing when they're up in their head trying to find an answer. And that's a little startling for most people because they just aren't aware that they're not breathing so, you know, a great deal of the time. 
And as they begin to see the value of the breath, you know, how it connects them to their body, to their breathing, you know, quite literally the heart and the gut have the same neurological connections as the brain. They're part of the brain. That's, that's science. And so if you really want to have integrated whole brain thinking, if you want to really want to neurologically wire your brain to optimize its receptive ability to information, then you, you need to have it all connected. And so they begin to value breathing into and being able to feel, breathing into and be able to heal. And, um, and it's, you know, it can start as much as just take, you know, breathing in and out and saying inwardly, saying in as you breathe in and inwardly saying out as you breathe out. You know, I've got a book on mindfulness and it's really <clears throat> 52 weeks of breathing styles and different things that you can do. You know, I've got a program called, what is it, Breathing and Success, where I just give people for 30 days different breathing styles that they can use in different situations to de-stress, to become more focused, to connect, to, you know, uh, literally heal, to, you know, whatever they need to be doing. So, yeah, does that answer your question in a sense? Yeah, there's a mm-hmm. lot of ways that I do it, but... I think just people, making people aware that uh, of how they're not breathing and the value of breathing, and that brings their focus to it. You know, a fellow that I just started working with two weeks ago, he's already, you know, paying attention to his breath all day long, and that's exactly what I, my intention is to support him in doing, so that he becomes aware, he begins to, you know, we can choose what level of consciousness we're on. And that level of consciousness, of course, is determined by what level, you know, how aware are we of what we're thinking, how aware are we of our feelings emotionally or physically, and how aware are we of what level of awareness that we're actually playing on in any given situation. So when they begin to appreciate that, oh, my breathing is determining that, and if I'm and they begin to value that, oh, if if I don't know an answer, I can't deal with something emotionally or I can't access information. All I need to do is breathe into a higher state of consciousness where that information is available, where that emotion can be looked at from a more supportive place, from a place of well, what's underneath that feeling, where is that feeling coming from? And really, really breathing into and helping that inner child heal during that breathing. So, yeah. So, uh, how would you describe the, the the connection between breath and healing? Because I, I think healing is another word that obviously people are familiar with, but it can mean a lot of different things to to different people. How, how do you see that connection between the breath and 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 what that is healing? Well, there's a couple of different types of healing, of course. And if we're talking about emotional healing, as a child, you know, you want love and you want unconditional love more than anything else. I've asked that question all over the world, and everybody seems to come up with that uh, that response. So I trust that that's true. Uh, and yet, we, as a child, when we run into something that we don't know how to emotionally handle, and there's nobody there to support us in emotionally handling it, we have to we take that and shove it down into our gut, into that inner cave to hopefully be looked at later or at least be concealed for now so that we can keep moving into life. And so we have to stop breathing for that containment process to take place. We have to, you know, stop breathing to shove that into the cave and slam those doors shut in hopes that nobody, you know, discovers those parts of ourselves that we're not sure are acceptable. And so, of course, if not, if stopping breathing is how we develop that emotional backlog, and then breathing into it is how we begin to open those doors, how we begin to to heal that emotional backlog. Because it's really, you know, my view, you know, simplistic as it might be, is that the the spiritual journey, the personal development journey, is really about breathing and letting go breathing and being. So what you're letting go of is holding your breath. 
<laughs> you know, it's in a really simplistic form. What you're let, what you're doing is letting go and breathing into that emotional lack, backlog and, and, and healing it, allowing yourself to acknowledge it, express it, and let it go. And so, you know, in terms of physical, you know, less than specific emotional healing, then you're dealing with energy. Your body is nothing but energy. You know, that's physics, and uh, that energy is vibrating at a certain rate. And if you're breathing, then you can regulate that vibrational rate and actually access levels of healing, uh, self-healing, healing with others that you wouldn't be otherwise uh, have because you wouldn't be in the right vibration, <clears throat> the right tune, or however you might see that. So healing and breathing go together. That it allows us to connect with ourselves, to heal blocks, to even recognize blocks and to be able to heal them, breathe into them. You know, when you're, you know, when you're on a journey of some type, say with medicine, if you're able to just breathe, then you're going to just be present with whatever is, comes, comes to you. You know, a lot of people go through all these dramatics when they're in some type of journey. And it's really, I understand and appreciate that because the energy is coming in stronger and they're not handling that energy and it throws them off and they, have emotions they haven't dealt with and issues come up that they don't want to deal with. And so they're, they're fighting and constricting or trying to figure out how to let that energy move through them. And if you're just, if you're just able to breathe and be present, able to breathe and be curious, then whatever comes is you're, you're just curious about it. You're open to it. You breathe into it and, and take the information, the insight, the experience, the awareness that it brings to you and um, and continue on your journey rather than have a wrestling match with it in terms of accepting or rejecting it. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned uh, an interesting idea about how breath is tied to to different states of consciousness or, or levels of awareness. Um, I think often for a lot of people, they, they would think about consciousness as one thing. I mean, I think everyone recognizes that to some degree we are conscious, uh, much in the same way that we breathe, we're somehow alive. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe there's some growing awareness that, that we can be in different states of consciousness, whether it's through a more like scientific lens of being in different brain waves or even like from a maybe more sports point of view of being like in a flow state that there's a, there's a certain level of consciousness that's being, uh, yeah. But how, how, how would you describe that when, when you're speaking about different levels of awareness or, or different states of consciousness? You know, I'll just go right to the heart of where it all began. You know, after I got out of the Marine Corps, I was a, I was a mess. I, I literally was a mess. My life was a mess. I was married and we got divorced and lost custody of my two sons. I didn't, you know, I found out that, you know, 80% of the guys that I'd gone through trainings with uh, had been killed. I found out that, you know, I had been a U.S. rowing champion and had this image of life that was, you know, the simplistic image that, oh, this is what it's all about, it's just winning and all of that fell apart, and uh, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't deal with it. So I used to, as I say, I was raised kind of in the woods, and I continued to spend a lot of time in the woods. I'd go off trail. and So I decided it was perhaps time to commit suicide. And so I went on a three-day journey with the intention of really taking a look at if that's the choice that I wanted to make. And at the end of the third day, I decided it was. and. Uh, you know, I was a big, strong young guy, so I wasn't doing it half-heartedly. I was throwing, you know, I was bringing my hunting knife right towards my heart at full speed. And uh, literally, I mean, I'd broken the skin already, but somewhere in there, I dissolved in a white ball of light. And, you know, it 20, whatever I was, I had no idea what that was, <laughs> you know, but all of a sudden I, there I was, you know, no awareness of my body or the world around me. 
engulfed in this white light and with a feeling of a deep sense of the perfection of life, a sense of the oneness of existence, a, an awareness that I had purpose and that taking my life was not, not the appropriate thing to do. And I don't know how long that lasted, but when I came out of it, I, you know, I was a changed being. And uh, so that was a different state of consciousness, <laughs> rather radically, one from suicidal to one oneness with God. And so a lot of what I've looked for, uh, you know, I've certainly accomplished that, uh, you know, even in my 30s, but is how do I return to that? How do I find that oneness again? How do I access that awareness of the perfection of existence? And and you you know with with the breathing with the focus with the quieting of the mind you can journey into the light you can journey into different levels of awareness you know you can you know we we know that this substance is really just vibrational energy and so um you know you can learn to breathe and let go to the point where this body just disappears and uh you know, and many other cities and powers that can come in. You know, they they turn out to be distractions. And but uh, for many years, as a spiritual teacher, I used them in my teaching, thinking that if people saw that, then they'd be inspired to you know become more conscious themselves. And it didn't really work out that way. They just got distracted and you know trying to put me on a pedestal so they could later knock me off or something. I don't know. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's, it's as business leaders, which is really what I work with now. That's how practical I've gotten in my life. You know, they have to, they have to have a very agile mind. They have to have a mind that's capable of, you know, being emotionally intelligent and compassionate. That's able to take in all of the rapid change and increased complexity that I referred to earlier and process it. Really, instantly. They have to be a surfer on a large wave and being absolutely present with that wave, not thinking about, well, what would we do last year? What's, what's coming next or anything like that? They have to be present. They have to be conscious, which allows them, you know, consciousness is really not about this narrow focus. It's about being fully aware of where you are in all of existence. Now, that's a tr really, truly conscious person. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's all degrees of consciousness. The more conscious I am, the more present I am, the more curious I am, the more confident in many ways, because I'm able to really handle things coming into my, my sphere of energy with a great deal of comfort and ease. And so, yeah, you just, uh, you know, if somebody else is doing something kind of bizarre emotionally or whatever else, you're not at the effect of that. You're just very present. You know, I've studied martial arts uh, extensively, and it's, you know, it's kind of like Tai Chi or, you know, I remember my Tai Chi teacher. He's about 80, little over 80 years old, a little tiny Chinese guy. <laughs> and one day he said, Ron, I want you to come up here and attack me. And I'm, you know, I was 210 pounds and ex-Marine <laughs> martial artist. So I'm going, this is not a good idea. <laughs> and yet, you know, he cajoled me and finally I, I went after him. And I went after him full on. Couldn't touch him. Could not touch him. And we're in just a small gymnasium, but you know, of course, the whole class is in hysterics because this big goofball me is trying to can't touch this, you know, guy who's just so present that I look like a ox trying to move at half speed or something like that to him. And so, those are different degrees of awareness, and, and it's moments of that like that that allow me to go, oh, okay. I want to become that present, that aware, so that time slows down, so that I'm handling life in a much more supportive, loving, uh, supportive, not only for myself, but others way. You, I mean, you shared very beautifully the, the, this idea of, of kind of your, your own journey and, and 
you know, this very deep suffering, even to, to the point of suicide. It seems like a very common story to a lot of people who are somehow drawn to, to, to these paths for kind of a, a lack of better word, a, a spiritual path, mm-hmm. is that there, there often is some deep sense of suffering. I mean, we hear of those stories today, but also through antiquity. It was often some of the greatest saints were the greatest sinners or the ones who suffered a, a great deal. Do you think there's something in that polarity that, that in a sense, in order to, to to move very high, we also have to know what it is to be very low. Um, or, or do you think that that's just some people's paths, and 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 also to some degree, it's not necessary that 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 perhaps there are things like techniques of, of breath work or other practices that that can alleviate someone needing to go to to, to such low points. Yeah, I think it's. I think you're right on. Uh, I do feel that most people will do just about anything to avoid looking in within. <laughs> most people will do just about everything to avoid looking at their emotional backlog. But if they get to a place where they pretty much have to, and they're confronted by it, their their life is limited to some degree by it, they're unable to function because they're not looking at it, that's when they are willing to. You know, it's, the sad point is that rather than being able to say, I can inspire you to create an optimal life with optimal leadership, you know, that's what I would love to advertise and have people come because they really, oh, they're inspired by that, that journey. You know, the truth is people have to be in pain. They have to be really challenged or troubled by something before they go, oh, well, maybe I need some help here. You know, that it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I have to get them to breathe <laughs> as we talked about. That's, that's how bad it has to be <laughs> is they're losing something. They're losing everything sometimes when they come to me. They're, they're recognizing that they need help. And I mean, we just, in this society, we just don't have the humility to reach out and, and, and be supported. We feel like we're supposed to do it. And, and clearly, you know, well, one point would be our relationship with ourself is mirrored in our relationship with, with others. So the degree of disconnection we have within is mirrored in our disconnection with others. And so that makes it, if we're not even feeling safe enough to identify with that little boy or little girl in there and help them heal, we're certainly not going to connect with others. But it's, you know, all of our issues, I mean, I, I've been doing this for you know, quite a few decades now. All of our issues are created in relationship to other people. And they have to be healed in relationship to other people. And oftentimes, I'm the first other person that they they come to, that they feel safe with, that they're willing to open up to because of the environment or whoever I am or whatever that is all about. And and that's that's the necessity of it. And yeah, and yeah, unfortunately, yeah, the pain level has to be fairly high sometimes before they're willing to do that rather than being inspired. Yeah. Like getting back to our breathing comment, you know, what's your greatest <clears throat> aspiration? Aspiration being what do you, what do you really need to breathe into? You know, and that, that is an indicator that it's not a piece of cake. It is a challenge. It might have some difficulties, but you're willing to. You're passionate enough about something that you're willing to aspire to it. You're willing to breathe into, breathe through whatever is limitations or challenges that you might have to keep you from it. It's an interesting thing you brought up because I think in a lot of this, again, for lack of better words, spiritual um, practices or these ideas of healing, um, I think especially more in a Western context, they, they they tend to be very focused on the self and, and to a large degree very vital because uh, no one else is going to do the work for us. And and at the end, we could even say there there is only self. Um, but but that tends to be a lot of people's focus. But but something you brought up, which is really interesting, and, and also I find more in, in a lot of traditional contexts, um, especially uh, like a, as I was saying before we started, I, I lived in the Amazon a long time, and 
there's a very different worldview or a very different cosmovision. And even from maybe a more Western psychoanalytic point of view, like most things are seen as some aspect of the self. Mm-hmm. Whereas in a lot of these traditional societies, even our own problems are seen as more of a relational aspect. It could be to nature, to someone else, to, to energies, mm-hmm. to spirits. Mm-hmm. But it's a very different way of, of looking at things. And it, it's very interesting that, that you also mentioned this idea that there's always this relational element. And mm-hmm. and until we heal those, like we we actually can't be healed ourselves. And And mm-hmm. that's a very different way of looking at things, I think, from how things are often taught. Well, even, I mean, you know, if you're moving people into what I would call more the spiritual realm after they've done the healing, if they've become a successful leader, oftentimes they're coming back to for more other other, other types of development. And what they recognize early on is, is they come in to heal themselves. But as they heal themselves, they've become more aware and connected with others that that empathy compassion that they develop for themselves all of a sudden they have more empathy and compassion for others and they take that into their organizations into their family and they care more about people they start to really create environments that are more trusting and supportive and nurturing for everybody and so you know my goal is to create a more conscious and caring world and so what I see as leaders is they become more conscious and, and aware of themselves that that trickles down, if you will, it radiates out into their relationships with others. And you create, you know, I've got one fellow, he's got five nine figure businesses that, you know, he's got probably a few thousand employees. And I've watched over the last three, four years now, you know, the changes within those organizations from him being kind of a growly top dog, you know, (laughs) controlling person to really being an open-hearted, supportive person that's bringing out the best in everybody. And, you know, in all honesty, he's more than doubled the value of several of those organizations in that time. Just because everybody feels like they're a valuable part of a valuable mission-driven organization that has purpose and meaning and they're in a supportive environment where they feel good and they're learning and growing and all of a sudden life makes sense. All of a sudden they're treating their spouses and their children better and their relationships are better in general. And it's all because of that, you know, that starts with that one person focusing on themselves and it radiates out into, into the many. So that's what it's all about for me is, you know, the highest level conscious leaders are the ones that can have the most significant lasting uh, impact on both a society or an organization. And so my thinking is if I can create, you know, a few thousand of those conscious leaders, then we might be able to actually impact the world to become more aware and conscious and concerned about the environment and each other and that type of thing. Was that the kind of the main reasoning behind kind of uh, focusing more on this idea of of, of, of conscious leadership or, or focusing on leaders in general? Is just uh, you felt that that could have more of an impact, or, or is is there something even on the individual level that that in a sense we are all leaders as well, whether it's of a, of a family or our own lives, and, and so you saw the the importance of, of even that idea of leadership. Yeah, my publisher actually introduced me to that direction because I'm not that I hadn't worked with some amazing leaders before, but I was also working with the general public and uh, so, you know, and had for a long time. But uh, as I started doing research in leadership, I really saw the impact that they can have and the value of, of supporting those people and becoming more aware and conscious and how that could impact the world. So for me, you know, it all started, I was, <laughs> I I have a hobby. I create Japanese gardens. I don't do it too much anymore other than my own, but uh, I've created, you know, million dollar Japanese gardens as a side hobby. And, uh, you know, I was out trimming my Japanese maple in my front yard. It's a low dissectum style uh, Japanese maple. And, you know, I've done that sort of thing enough that I don't have to think about it. So about midway through, I realized I was in a very, quiet, high state of consciousness and just 
watching my hands kind of move through the trees and clipping and things. But uh, with a quiet mind, you can begin to recognize subconscious thoughts. And I caught myself having an inner conversation with my great grandsons. And it was just, you know, being made up, obviously, by my subconscious, because they were a little older than they actually were at the time. And but they were asking me why I'm leaving the world in worse condition than I found it in or when I was a child. And I was in the middle of prattling on about all my reasons why. And, uh, you know, <laughs> they're smart enough. And I was caught myself recognizing, well, that was all bullshit. <laughs> and uh, so it was really in that moment that I said, I, I am out of integrity if I don't do everything all that I can to make this world a better place for these these two boys. And of course that's all all kids, all all people coming. And so um uh, and it was about that time that I had that conversation with my publisher and he he said you don't seem to recognize that you have an extraordinarily unique skill to take people into those higher levels of, of leadership, higher levels of consciousness. And and so I'm you know, I've got a handful of leadership books, the top leadership books, and you know, off to my left here. And in each one of those, they can delineate the different levels of leadership. They can give you the characteristics of those different levels of leadership. And as you go through them, you realize, oh, they're just different levels of consciousness, and different levels of awareness of themselves and other self-awareness. And and so, but in all of them, they they say, well, this is how you move up into those levels but they as much as i knew the characteristics of the highest level they didn't know how to get people to actually move into that level and that happens to be exactly what i know how to do and that's exactly what my work's all about so i realized i had you know my sort of eclectic <laughs> rambling through life experience uh, that i had has really led me to a place where that is what my life's about you know i don't plan on retiring i plan on you know hopefully impacting the world in a significant way it's interesting because um some of the audience may be familiar with this but uh when i was around i think 15 it was just when i got my my driver's license uh which may, may may date me a little bit when you could still get a, a license at 15 years old. But yeah. <laughs> um, I, I I remember I, I was in a bookstore and I um, and I, I never went to, to bookstores. I also maybe similar to you. I I enjoyed being in the woods and I, I think looking back, I was very fortunate to, to have that opportunity. So sitting down to reading always was more of a chore than a uh -huh. than a than a pleasure. But but I was actually looking for a, a gift from my mother, and on the, I went to this you know discount book table because I didn't have a lot of money, obviously. And mm -hmm. this this one little book stood out, uh, and it was called the Tao Te Ching. And um, <laughs> I, I didn't understand why, but something drew me to it. And it was the only book that was anything uh, kind of everything else was like, you know, how to how to cook or how to do this and. Um, <laughs> But I, I started reading through it, and 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 it just blew me away by the simplicity. It just it all seemed to make sense, and but beyond my rational mind, and 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 I couldn't really understand it. But I I picked it up, and it, it's had a tremendous influence on my life. But I was just reminded of that because one of the interesting things about that book, and and a lot of people look at it as one of, if for some people, the the, the most predominant book on spirituality. Is, is a, a a very large part of that book is focused on this idea of leadership. Like uh, they're, they're often using this word like a, a sage king or, or or a ruler or a leader, and it's really like how to rule from from the highest place, from the highest place of 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 not doing in a way, and and through that not doing, having everything be accomplished in in in, in the exact precise way it needs. But it's it's quite interesting because just as you were speaking of leadership, it, it reminded me of that, and 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 even in some of these like most uh, whatever you want to call them famous spiritual books, there there's actually a huge emphasis on this idea of leadership. Yeah, yeah, good catch there. I like that. Mm. Yeah, I mean. Uh, 
ultimately, in terms of leadership training, what I'm taking people into is they have literally neurologically rewired their brain. I mean, I, I understand the brain neurology quite well. And and so all that I do is literally helping them shift that neurology and uh, retrain their brain in that way. And and it's it's really, for me, you can't handle the rapid change and increased complexity that I've mentioned a couple of times in business. If you're not present, if you're trying to figure things out, if you're looking at, well, what did we do to the last time this happened in the organization? Or how do I handle these different, you know, diversity questions that I've never had to deal with before? Or, you know, all of a sudden I can't control things top down authoritatively. I've got to feel my way through this. And, and it's like the only, <coughs> excuse me, and the only way to do that is, is what I call big mind, because you, you know, ultimately what I'm training people to do is to get to a place of trust that if they quiet their mind and look inwardly for answers, that they'll come to them. And so as they do that, they have the agility, the ability to really be present in any and all situations and handle it in an optimum sort of way. You know, an example that I would share is, that, you know, I was working with the CEO in San Francisco it was during the, uh, you know, big tech. Everybody was making lots of money, and uh, and you know, I I was working with him personally and developing his leadership skills and that type of thing. But he found out that I also designed Japanese gardens, and he was very excited about having one created for his wife and. And of course, he wanted a bigger, better million dollar garden. <laughs> and I just didn't have time. I mean, I had all my clients and was busy doing my work. And, uh, but he was quite insistent. And, and it was, it was an opportunity because he had a beautiful home and then there was an acre that he wanted to, wanted to shift. And I met his wife and I could tell she really wanted a more spiritual meditative space in, in, in you know, in their yard. And so I, I, you know, I was living in Mill Valley, just above San Francisco there, and sitting up, you know, I went up on the hill behind my house in the Redwoods, and and just, you know, I said, okay, so these are the people I'm creating it for. I'm creating a Japanese garden. I'm creating it to really impact and transform their life. And those were my three sort of formulaic uh, indicators and that I put out into the universe. And then I just sat in meditation sat with a very quiet mind and I watched that garden begin to, you know, the 120 foot stream, you know, coming down into the organic 50 by 65 pond with a turtle island and the bamboo forest and the, you know, the meditation hut. And uh, I just watched it over the next hour and a half create itself in my mind. And it really was one of the most beautiful gardens I'd ever seen. And three months later, it was done, and I had won all kinds of awards international and for design and technology and that. And that's you can only do that with big mind. I never made drawings. I never did anything like that with it because well, I didn't. I didn't need to. It was all there. And that's when you turn your mind into an optimum receiver. You basically. You don't have to rely on a certain frequency like theta or data delta. Or, you know, you, you basically can, in that quiet place, access, there's, there's literally an alpha bridge that, that connects all of those different frequencies. So you're accessing the best of who and what you are, best of what's available uh, from that quiet place. And, you know, I watch clients create all sorts of things, designs, answer questions, come up with answers, just all sorts of, you know, whatever whatever they need, they can go into this quiet place and access it in moments rather than days, rather than going down dead-end pathways that get frustrating and expensive. And, and so, yeah, if you're going to be a high-level leader, you have to be able to to go into those levels, those states of awareness so that you can access the best of who and what you are. And that's, then it's fun. Then all of a sudden work is not work any longer. 
You, you, you spoke a little bit um, uh, earlier on in the conversation uh, uh, about plant medicines, which you know you usually refers to to kind of uh, certain plants that that have an ability to to alter our consciousness in a in a very certain or particular way, and and then you've also been speaking a lot about kind of this passion of, of gardening, of, of working with plants with your hands and right. even being inspired under this, this tree with the conversation of your grandson going into this meditative space and, and right. uh, almost like being a channel to, to, to something that, that came through you that, that was, that was you know, filled with this inspiration, this idea of spirit. And often even the, these, these kind of plant medicines can be called like plant spirit medicine, that somehow they're filling us with spirit. Is there anything you can share about your own work, like working with plant medicines or your relationship uh, to, to plants that's, that, that's had some impact on you or that, that you find also useful in your practice? Or is that something you, you specifically focus on or is just something more that you, you have kind of an intuitive uh, connection to? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I've explored it considerably throughout my life. Mm-hmm. But uh, what I find is, you know, and all the research really shows the same, that when you're developing somebody to become a conscious leader, to become a high-level, post-conventional conscious leader, what you really, when you look at their lives, they've done the inner work, they've healed the inner child, they've really become more self-aware and, and, and done that basic foundational work. But then their life becomes really a journey of mindfulness. It doesn't really, you know, they might do yoga, they might do meditation, they might do more what we'd call specific mind, mindfulness uh, exercises or tools that they use. But the people that I'm working with really begin to bring all mindfulness to all aspects of their life. You know, if they're playing golf, it's really a mindfulness game. If, if they're walking with their, their spouse, it's a mindfulness game. Everything is done mindfully with that, that, presence and awareness and breathing into it and and that is really a core foundational piece that allows them to build that life of you know of, of greater awareness and and heightened leadership ability uh, but the other component is that they also bring in what I would call significant personal transformational experiences and they're open to those they invite those into their life now those could be things like a birth or a death or some you know dramatic experience within your life but i also find that um, after i helped them create that foundational piece that uh, supporting them in intentionally using medicine to to create a significant personal transformational experience uh, i use it in a way by the time a client would be involved with that they really are able to just be present for five, six hours easily and just in total laying down, you know, music on, eyes covered and and uh, just really breathing. And then, you know, they're not moving, they're not wrestling with themselves or going through dramatic shifts and changes. They're just present and going through these incredible experiences that, are really designed to, I've helped them get to this level of consciousness. And now those, those, those days when they're, when they're journeying it, it allows them to experience another state of consciousness, another level of awareness, another level of letting go that they're capable of, but they weren't aware that they were capable of. And so all of a sudden, by the time they finish that, that becomes their new normal. That becomes their target, uh, you know, desired way of being. The, the degree of being that open-hearted, that open-minded. And so, you know, and then a few months later, or you know, whatever the time frame is, as they've continued their their daily exercises, their mindfulness and their awareness and their breathing, then they're ready for another significant shift. And again, it's not other than just taking them into that next level that they're capable of being. And that's really all I'm supporting them in. And so it's a very 
healing experience. It's a very comfortable, uh, very nurturing experience for them. And I live, you know, on an island and in the middle of the woods with a big pond. And so it's a fairly ideal physical environment for that type of supportive growth. So, yeah. So to me, it's, it's just life offers us a tremendous amount of tools. All I do is look for the right tool in the right time in the right situation to, that most supports somebody. So med, plant medicines are just a tool. I, I've been around communities that use it uh, as kind of their end, end all be all whatever. I don't see it working very well. I see them 10, 20 years later still whining about the same things and having the same issues and all of those types of things. When I see it used in conjunction with an intentionally uh, motivated uh, personal development process, then I see incredible transformation. Literal, literal transformation into a different way of being, different person, and uh, and that's really kind of where I am with it. Are there are, are there any particular plants that you find uh, especially useful, or, or traditions, or techniques, or, or sets and settings, or even just ways of working with it that you find to be more conducive for for personal development? Well, you know, I mean, you can, uh, if somebody is suffering from PTSD, you know, due to some, you know, post-war um, experience or something like that, certainly something like ayahuasca can have a, a that's the only thing that can kind of reach in there and <laughs> and get them out of that old mindset that uh, they're locked into. But as much as ayahuasca is one of the most powerful and supportive uh, guides, if you will. Um, I find it's also, you know, I used to be kind of the spiritual warrior guy. You know, it's like, where's that edge? I want to, you know, I want to be on that edge of growth and development and life and all of that. And and it worked for me in that way, you know. But but I also felt it was sort of taking me. You know, it was like, okay, Ron, here we go on our journey in this, you know, and I'm just sort of along for the ride. And uh, and I got to a point in my life where I felt like it was time to be gentler and kinder to myself. Um, and I also, from that shift into other plant medicines, you know, psilocybin, that type of thing, um, I also began to recognize, oh, it, the, it's not the plant, it's not the medicine that's doing it, I'm doing it. And, and it kind of put me more, being more responsible for my life, in charge of my life. I'm not... Have, I'm not surrendering to something that's going to transform me. I'm using tools that, to tra you know, intentionally to, to transform myself. And I found that very empowering. And um, so, you know, I don't use that one medicine that I might have, you know, 30 years ago or something like that. Uh, you know, there's MDMA, which is a very heart opening uh, experience for most people, especially, you know, it's very, uh, you know, affected by the environment that you're in and what's going on, but with the environment that I create, it's a very heart opening experience for people. They begin to to connect with themselves. They feel safer with themselves. They're able to connect with their partner and kids and others afterwards. And and that you know that that's a very powerful tool in that sort of subtle way. You know, but then you know you get into psilocybin. That's that takes them into a whole nother level of, you know, letting go and, and being present and, and enjoying that, you know, their, whatever their sense of reality might be is not a full perspective of what it is. And, uh, and then, you know, you might go into something with acid and which can actually kind of shake, you know, they, they, they have to be really present rather than just, lollygagging around on a on a nice little ride through the music or something and uh, and they learn to handle that they learn to be present even in that and and that gives them the courage to recognize that they can handle anything that life brings them you know and so those are kind of what i stay with hmm. 
you 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 spoke about that you were very interested and in, and in, and in quite versed in in brain neurology and and that that, that whole science of neurology and, and neuroscience seems to be something that's 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 at the forefront of a lot of science and and, and I think really interesting discoveries are, are being made. There's also a lot of uh, the, the 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 neuroscience aspect to, to things like plant medicines to breath work to, to very spiritual practices can can you speak a little bit about that about what you find interesting about the the neurology of the brain and 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 what that uh, can can yeah. kind of help us with yeah it kind of i i have uh, you said you weren't much of a reader well i was i was an avid reader i actually ended up with a master's degree and, and literature in english <laughs> that's how much of a reader i am <laughs> so as voraciously as i would take in you know, reading and books and that type of thing and uh, i happened to be i was teaching at a college level uh, and i was very successful and I was teaching creative writing teaching literature creating learning development uh, support systems within the organization learning centers and that type of thing in the colleges and uh and uh, you know i was a young guy still i was in my 20s and people started asking me well what are you doing how do you do this i had no idea it was just all intuitive it was just me doing me and having fun with it i had been a terrible student when i was younger and uh, it wasn't until after the marine corps that i actually learned to study and you know i did quite well after that but so maybe that was my edge as i understood how people learned I had had to struggle with and learn myself to how to learn, but it really, you know, um, it was in that I, I actually left teaching to go get a PhD in psychology about learning. What's the psychology of learning? How that works? And of course, in preparation for that, uh, the doors opened in terms of well what's the human potential <laughs> what's spirituality what all of those things opened up you know i remember uh, i kind of kept moving to different universities because i was looking for you know i wasn't looking for information i could get that on my own i was looking for in, you know inspiration i was looking for teachers that were, were actually had wisdom and uh, this one she's president of the university that i was looking into and you're going to and she saw my frustration and she said, well, what are you doing tonight? And I said, well, I, you know, no plans. And so I went with her to, uh, it turns out, you know, the spiritual teacher. Uh, and, you know, he, he was kind of walked in as if he'd just come off the tennis court and very jovial, you know, joking kind of guy. And uh, so it was very comfortable. And, you know, it was a large room, with a lot of people in chairs. And, uh, and as... You know, he said, well, let's do an, you know, after he'd done his little shtick and spiel, he said, well, let's do an open eye meditation. And and uh, I had no idea what that was. And so I was sitting there and as he was, as, you know, we're all meditating, he was scanning the room, going from person to person to person, looking into their eyes. And when he came to me, I had no expectations, I had no images. And all of a sudden, the entire room dissolved around me. Uh, he dissolved into this golden molten ball of light. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, those feelings that I had had earlier uh, that I mentioned, you know, just that, that oneness, that connection, that wholeness came into play. And so that caught my attention. <laughs> and so, you know, it was trying to, remember where, where, what took me on this path what what it was your question sorry um what was my question um <laughs> <laughs> I, I i think i also got lost in oh the, neurology in the okay. story. so neurology yeah, so, yeah. So yeah. Thing. <laughs> and so um yeah so that i i just became very inquisitive very interested because all of a sudden i knew there was a tremendous amount more and i really wanted to find out about that more and i became co-director of a brain integration center because we were studying all the left and right brain neurological studies that were going on at the time and and so it, i became aware of in those practices how to literally neurologically rewire the brain 
you know, kids with learning problems, uh, people with, who were too left brain logical and needed to be more spontaneous and artistic or something like that. And so I realized that the pliability and the capability of the mind, you know, we had one fellow who was, uh, he'd been an attorney, a pretty hard nosed, successful attorney, but he had literally lost half of his brain in an auto accident. And he became an artist, you know, within a year, I saw him develop into this whole different other being. So the reality of that, that ability uh, was very, very deep within me. And so, you know, it's, it's like quite in, in a very realistic way, whatever you're focusing on is what you're training your brain to do. You know, if, if you lose the ability to to see, for example, well, that part of your brain, you'll you'll just listen more carefully, and so those, all that neurology within the optic nerve levels will begin to change into auditory, uh, you know, nerves and, and uses. And so you, the brain is just this extraordinarily pliable, ever changing, always growing. You know, I mean, when I was growing up, we thought. Well, you've got X number of brain cells and they start dying off as you get older. Well, now we know that that's absolutely not true, and that they continue to grow. They continue to develop. You can continue to learn. You know, I'm in my mid-70s and I feel probably as mentally capable as I've ever been. And uh, so I, I don't see any limitation coming from that unless you, you know, aren't paying attention to your diet and what you're doing with your body and what you're doing with your mind, then of course it'll, you know, you'll, your comfort zone will end up killing you, of course. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's really, the mind to me, you know, the, the breath and the mind are really absolutely connected because it's, it's like, you know, I remember laying out in the desert uh, when I was with one of my spiritual teachers and I was, I was breathing and all of a sudden I was, I felt myself moving out of my body. And, and as I was moving out of my body, I felt like I was not so much breathing anymore as I was being breathed. And as I expanded more into the, into the cosmos, I felt like I was becoming the breath. And, you know, so you're, you're, you're breathing, you're being breathed, becoming the breath. And, and then you dissolve in the infinite. You know, you go even if you let go enough, you'll go into what's called the void, where everything comes from and returns to. It. So, neurology is really how do you want to set up this receiver so you're capable of receiving any and all things that are available to you. And so, yeah, that's whether you want to just function better as a leader, as a you know person on the planet or whatever else that really neurologically rewiring your brain to optimize uh, your capabilities of, of of accessing everything who and what we are and well beyond that you know <laughs> earlier on you used a word that I, I find very fascinating which is integrity which I think is often associated with with having certain principles, certain morals, but also it is etymology has to do with wholeness, has to do with healing. Right. Um, is that something you 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 focus a lot in in your work, and and especially with this idea of leadership? Is is this idea of integrity? It's a good point. I don't think I do. To be honest with you, I, not in terms of a language uh, in a skill, but uh, it is all about integrity. It is all about taking responsibility for for life, for your life, for your existence. You know, it's it's responsibility to means me means being able to respond appropriately on all levels. Well, to be able to respond appropriately on all levels means you have to be present and conscious on all levels. And so there's that little trick of you have to be breathing to do that. <laughs> and uh, so it all begins to intermesh and uh, come together with that. Um, you know, it's like somebody asked me about boundaries the other day. And it's like, well, I know people mm -hmm. say I have really good boundaries, but I have no awareness of having any boundaries. 
all I have is a, a, the ability to be aware and take care of myself. So when somebody is coming across my boundaries, I'm I'm aware of it far beyond, you know, far sooner and uh, than most people might be aware, and I'm sending out indicators that it's not working or it's inappropriate or it, they shouldn't do that in very, very subtle ways so that they pick those up. So people don't cross my boundaries because, you know, unless they're just barging through life and not paying any attention, which I haven't run into in, you know, 50 years. <laughs> so I think our level of awareness determines our energy and that energy determines really the flow that we go through existence with. You know, I think... You know, I see everything as an opportunity. I see literally everything that comes into my life as a perfectly designed gift to support me in opening up my heart and loving more fully, you know. And, you know, I think most people, when they really look at the most challenging aspects of their life, can also look back, hopefully in a way, and go, oh, yeah, that was also one of the best and most meaningful or impactful parts of my life. And so it's really... Yeah, it's beginning to, we're not victims here. We we get to play on any level we want to. We are literally creating our life. And to me, I'm a sailor, so to me it's like there's a, there's, there's a front sail and there's two little ribbons off the, the, the wire that comes from the top of the, you know, it's, um, one of the main stays that hold the mast up. And those little ribbons, those little, you know, pieces of thread, they're called telltales. And all they are is really indicators that if I'm, if I'm sailing too high in the wind, that one will start to move and I just need to back off and fall off of the wind a little bit. If I'm too far off the wind, the other one will move. So I move a little more into the wind. And so, those telltales are really a, a wonderful thing to understand because our breathing uh, are, is our really our essential indicator, telltale in our life. How my breathing tells me, am I what am I dealing with? You know, initially I had to learn to breathe into things. Now my breathing automatically, neurologically, to step back into that, my brain has been wired to this point where it neurologically handles that breathing component to optimize how I'm going to be able to deal with anything that's coming into my life. And so it's really just it's uh, that neurology, that intention, that all of that is just an interplay of of who we become. And, yeah, and we get to choose who we become so that we can respond appropriately and supportively in all aspects of our life relationship to ourselves and to others you know but you have to be brave enough to fall in love with yourself you have to be brave enough to be kind to yourself you have to be brave enough to go into life with an open heart and an open mind rather than cramming yourself into a limited range of consciousness that you know feels safe to you that you know, I mean, all the research shows that any any limitation in that really is what dictates your how you go through life, your habits, your what you eat, how you live, how you do relationship. And if you look at comfort zones, they really literally do end up killing people. You know, eight out of the ten reasons people die are lifestyle choices. And that lifestyle choice is a result of their level of consciousness, their comfort zone. You know, so there you go. <laughs> well, great, Ron. Well, thank you so much. I, I know we're coming up on our on our time. Is there is there anything that um, that we didn't touch on that you'd like to to address before we we bring it to a close? I think we kind of zoomed around the universe pretty well. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, one thing that I also find quite interesting, it, you you mentioned it briefly, is this idea of martial arts, and that's that's something that's had a big impact on my life, and mm -hmm. I, I think it's 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 changing. But I, I think for a long time there, those two things were not really seen as going hand in hand. These ideas of spirituality right. or martial arts, but right. again, if you look traditionally, whether it was the, the Shaolin monks who practice martial arts, or, or Wudong, or even very traditional societies that I spent with in the Amazon, one, one of their main uh, activities or it was even practiced in a spiritual sense was some form of martial art, whether it was wrestling or, or, or knife fighting. But, um, you know, there, there is something that also for me is very powerful in that and in, in teachings of presence, of, of breath, of, of, of dynamics of nature, oh, of, of how that, our brain that's works. one of the main mindfulness tools to use, yeah. yeah. The, the thing in Martin, I happen to be around martial arts a lot. I've got a good friend who's been teaching it for 55 years now. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, what I find in the martial arts is a lot of people went into it for because they wanted to be able to protect themselves. And if you don't end up healing that part, um, you end up kind of using the martial arts in, in, in a limiting way. And so, yeah, you have to do the inner work. You have to heal so that you're the martial arts becomes, you know, a much more elevated aspect of your life. And it's not about trying to protect that little child who was bullied when he was 10 or something like that. It's got to become more that integration into the flow of it, into the presence of it. And, and you know, with the body, that's, that's, that's always right there for you. You know, am I present or not? You know, it's like, it's like the, the whirling dervish, they, they whirl in circles and that's their meditation. It's like if you've ever done it or tried it, you realize one fraction of a thought that's, you know, other than being present with that, all of a sudden, you know, you get thrown off. And so martial arts are certainly like that. Yeah. Well, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on and sharing, Ron. It, it was a real yeah, pleasure. If if people are interested in in learning more about you or reaching out to you, are there are there good ways they can do that? Well, I think the website ronstotts dot com is good. Or just if they just enter next level discovery call dot com, that'll take them to a calendar. They can you know talk with me one on one, and that's that's fine too. So yeah, either way. Yeah, and there's lots of I, truth is on my website. There's a lot of free things that people find incredibly valuable. So, you know, they welcome to go get those and begin the journey. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming on again. And uh, I, I think everyone will get a lot out of this and we'll, we'll put a link to those in the show notes and, mm -hmm. um, and, and thank you again. And I, I really wish you the best in all your journey. And uh, I feel like there's a lot more we could talk about too. So maybe uh, at some point mm -hmm. down the line, we can do a, a round two Re as well. Reconnect at any point. I agree. I enjoyed it very much. You did a great job. So I appreciate it. And thank yeah. you everybody for coming. Yeah. So there we go. All right. All right, everyone. That's it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Ron. I really enjoyed sitting down with him, uh, speaking to him, uh, learning more about his life, a uh, really, really interesting life he's had, and, and I think really, really valuable uh, work he's doing. So if you'd like to check out more about him, you can check out his website, which he mentioned. Um, as always, if you're able to support this podcast, that's a really big help to me. Um, Patreon is a really good option. It's a website you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. There's different tiers you can sign up for. Those tiers also give you different things back, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. To all the people who are supporting that way, to all the patrons, as always, thank you very much for your help. I, I really appreciate it. And if you're able to sign up for that, it is a really big help uh, in allowing me to continue making these episodes. If you're not able to do that, um, if you're viewing this on YouTube or Rumble, hitting the subscribe button, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, all of those things really help to drive the algorithms. And then if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, 
Spotify, uh, leaving a starred rating and a short review is also really helpful. Um, also, as I mentioned during the intro talk, uh, if you're interested in going deeper into plant medicine, uh, working with myself and my colleague Marav Artsy, uh, we are just finishing a retreat here in the Sacred Valley, uh, but we have scheduled a couple retreats coming up. One is in May in Portugal, and the other is um, in Ontario, Canada in August. And those are really beautiful opportunities if you're interested in learning more directly experientially from plants and healing from plants and, and really experiencing um, kind of the, the, the magic and wonder that a lot of these plants open us up to. So if you're interested in that, uh, we I, I believe we still have a couple spots left for both of those retreats. Um, if you'd like more information, you can go to my website, which is nicotianarustica.org. And also Marav has a site, which is tobacco diets.com. So thank you all for tuning in. I hope this finds you all well, and I will see you all on the next episode.